Good evening and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirror, President and CEO of the Society. Tonight's program, The Nine, Inside the Secret World of the Supreme Court, is part of the Bernard and Irene Schwartz Distinguished Speaker Series, the heart of our public programs. As always, I'd like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Schwartz for their support, which has enabled us to bring so many prominent authors and historians to the society. I'd also like to recognize members of our Chairman's Council with us this evening and thank them for all their support of the work that we do. Tonight's program will last an hour and will include a question and answer session, time permitting. Following the program, we invite you to join us for a reception and book signing with our guests whose books you may purchase for a special program night discount in our museum store. Tonight's program offers a rare, deep look into the most private and impenetrable branch of our government, the United States Supreme Court. To give us this look, we are pleased to welcome two very distinguished speakers to the society. Jeffrey Tubin is a senior legal analyst for CNN and staff writer at The New Yorker, where he's covered legal affairs since 1993. He is a former legal analyst for ABC News and previously served as an assistant U.S. attorney in Brooklyn. He's authored several books, including The Nine, Inside the Secret World of the Supreme Court, and Opening Arguments, A Young Lawyer's First Case, United States versus Oliver North. Mr. Tubin is joined by Margot Adler, a national public radio correspondent and the host of NPR's weekly legal show, Justice Talking. As host of Justice Talking, Ms. Adler explores the key cases and controversies facing the nation's courts. From 1972 to 1990, she hosted a weekly live t talk show on WBAI-FM in New York City. Before we begin, I'd just like to ask that you kindly turn off your cell phones and now please join me in welcoming our guests to the New York Historical Society. What a great crowd. There's so many people here. It's, it's fantastic. Amazing. Unbelievable. It's totally amazing. I'm so I get all the introduction remarks and, and I don't need to do them because I've already the introductions have already been made. Hello, Margo. Hello. Um, this it's is what really, I look like in long pants, Margo. That's right, because we, we're both I'll confess this, we're both members of the JCC a block right. away. We see each other. So yeah. we've actually seen each other in other clothes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So um, I'm going to begin. I'll, you know, we'll at, we'll do questions and answers here between us for like a half an hour or so, and then we'll open it up to you because it clearly looks like there's a very smart and fascinating audience here. So that's what we'll do. So to start out, Jeffrey, I know that you don't want to say which justices and clerks you spoke to, but it's almost become a spectator sport. I've been noticing that. All the reviewers are basically trying to figure out um, who you talk to, which clerks, which justices, etc. And um, tell us, first of all, just in general, how you went about researching the book, why you decided to do this, and what were the central issues that you were kind of thinking about as you decided to do this? Well, let, let me just... That, that, that's there are a lot there are a lot of questions. Let me just tell you how I sort of got started on on the on the book. Um, three summers ago, um, I had a wonderful idea. I thought um, I was going to write a legal thriller because I thought, like, who better than I? You know, I've written books. I work in this field, and my agent. Uh, literary agent Esther Newberg said, wow, that really sounds like a good idea. You'd be well. And she said, um, you know, Phyllis Grant, a famous great editor at Doubleday, was really interested in my work and would really love to see the novel. And so I spent the summer writing the three, chap three chapters and I sent them to Phyllis and Phyllis invited me to her apartment and, uh, you know, gave me a Diet Coke and, sat and we sat down and she said, Jeff, these are dreadful. <laughs> these, these are, these, these, you know, I know that you've only written three chapters, but I can tell the novel will be very bad. Um, so in the best author's tradition, I said, Phyllis, you know, I'm, I'm getting like mixed signals here. Uh, 
And she sort of pushed the novel away, and she said, what you should do is write a book about the Supreme Court. And, and it was literally like a light bulb went off in my head, because I had been covering the court off and on at The New Yorker and on television. And I loved The Brethren, um, the wonderful book by Bob Woodward and Scott Armstrong. But it had been published in 1979, which was a long time ago. And the court had turned over in its entirety, and I thought it was time for a sort of serious journalistic investigation of, you know, behind the scenes of the Supreme Court. So as you decided to do this, what was the most difficult part of your research? Getting cooperation. This, this was, you know, my last book was Too Close to Call about the recount in Florida. And I have never had a more easy reporting assignment than that, because everyone who was involved in that story um, in, um, in Florida knew how historic it was from the moment they arrived. Of course, you know, had never been involved, and no one had ever been involved in something like that. And they were all anxious to talk about their role on, on both the winners and the losers. Supreme Court is very different. I mean, just actually, let me just parent that. I mean, one of the peculiarity, I mean, one of the frustrations of writing too close to call is that Al Gore never agreed to talk to me. Um, and I, um, but, but while I was working on the nine, I happened to uh, meet Gore and I was telling him about the nine and I said, which was true, I said, you know, Mr. Vice President, I think I'm the biggest Bush v. Gore junkie in the world. And he said to me, you may be second. Uh, and I thought, you know what, he might have a point there. Because uh, the stakes, you know, I'm interested, but really, what difference would it make yeah, well, uh, to me? Um, but um, the, 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 what was so hard about the nine was getting to the uh, justices, having them agree to talk to me, and, and, the, and the law clerks. I mean, the good thing about the law clerks is that there are lots of them. And I, I am blessed with a thick skin, and there were many law clerks who, when I called them, would hang up on me and tell me what a terrible person I was for prying in. But fortunately, not all of them, and uh, they, were a great, they were a great source. Well, so. I think um, the most surprising thing, since you've been talking about Bush v. Gore, uh, the most surprising thing in your book for many of us who have read it was the fact that Justice Souter almost resigned after Bush v. Gore. Um, you know, tell us how you, you know, how you learned about that and also you really are pretty strong in your sort of condemnation about what happened. I mean, almost all of the ju justices come in for some pretty hard knocks. Uh, even, even your favorite, Sandra Day O'Connor, right. comes in for Especially. some hard you know, yeah. knocks uh, over Bush v. Gore. The, um, you know, Bush v. Gore, the, the book, for those of you who haven't read it, and I assume that's many of you, um, the, uh, you know, the book is not a polemic. It's not, you know, thumbs up on this decision, thumbs up on that decision. It's, it's more of a narrative. It's genial. more analytical. I call it very genial. It's genial. That's right. Genial. <laughs> that seems a little wimpy. It's a little more than genial. Yeah, right, right, it's like, right. oh, <laughs> they gather every year, every right, week right, and decide okay, cases. Okay, and, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, um, I'm genial, but the book is not. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> The, um, what was I talking about? No, Bush the uh, Gore, Bush v. Gore. That, that I really don't, you know, evaluate all the cases except Bush v. Gore. I really think Bush v. Gore was a very low moment in the court's history. I think it's regrettable on many levels. Not because it led to George Bush being president, but because it, I mean, I can tell by the rumble that that's why you don't like it. <laughs> You're on the upper side. I remember side where we are, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, it, but because of the way the decision was written and the way it, it seemed to be a betrayal of the conservative principles that the justices and the majority usually espouse, I mean, what it means to be a judicial conservative is to believe that states control state functions, like, say, elections. It means um, that the Equal Protection Clause, when construed to about the rights of African Americans or women is narrowly construed, but here you had the conservatives interfering with a state function, construing the Equal prote Protection Clause very broadly for the benefit of a plaintiff named George W. Bush, and writing in the most notorious sentence in the opinion 